Respectful fellow practitioners and Dharma protectors, good evening, Amitofo. Today we will continue to learn how to understand Buddhism and how to live a happy and fulfilling life. Why do we want to learn Buddhism? To understand Buddhism. No matter what race you are or what country you come from, we must understand why. I believe every one of us has a sense of hope, especially the young people. The time for young people to practice is now. They all hope that they can be successful in their career, not just the professional side, but also their personal life. To be happy without pain, without worries. That's what we call living a happy life. A lot of people want to seek this kind of treasure, called a perfect, beautiful life. However, this treasure already exists in us, and also this treasure is found in Buddhism, or pointed out by Buddhism. However, we are not aware of it. This treasure is very clearly stated in Buddhism. As long as you learn seriously, you will get it. You will get the treasure. We must understand that, we must understand this point. Everyone has this treasure, but you need to work hard to find it. In the past, back in the nationalist China era, in the early 1900s, Buddhism was required, not just a choice, but was a necessity for the people living in this time, the 20th century, and the 21st century is no exception, because as humans, we have a lot of issues that need to be resolved and seek help to be solved. So this is the use of Buddhism to us. So we have talked about the terminology and we have talked about enlightenment. So we have learned about the first level of right awakening. So we're moving on to the second level called equally perfect enlightenment or Samyak Sambodhi. Why do we need to learn an enlightenment that is equally perfect to Buddha? Why do we need to achieve this level? It is because a person who has equally perfect enlightenment has selflessness. If using a very shallow way to describe me, like who am I, the self, the easiest way to understand it, the shallowest way to see it, is selfishness and self-interest. Today, why do we practice Buddhism for a long amount of time but there is no effect or the effect is minimal, very small, is because of our selfishness. Some people even have more afflictions after learning Buddhism. The more they learn, the more burden they feel, the more unhappy they are, because deep inside their heart, there is still an I. This false self is still there. Deep inside, it's still me, 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 and because of I, because if there is still I, an illusion of self, we have all the afflictions. Because I'm happy, because I'm sad, because I don't get, I need, I don't need, I love, I don't love, I love, I hate. There's a lot coming from this I. That's why Buddha told us that the first step to gain enlightenment which is true freedom, is to break through the illusion of I. When you are sick, you go to the doctor, right? So the same thing, if your view is wrong, or if you are lost spiritually in all respects, you need a doctor like Buddha to solve it, to help you by pointing out the solution. We need to know that every one of us has a disease, not just our body, our heart as well, not just mental, like our heart, because of the false view of self, illusion of self, because there is self, then if self cannot be satisfied, 
If self cannot reach anything, then it's not happy. Therefore, the afflictions begin. Only a person who is selfless can see things clearly. They will be able to discern the truth from the falsehood, good from evil, right from wrong, and benefit from harm. It's a bit deep now because we're talking about equally perfect enlightenment. We need to savor it, to pay attention to it. What is real and false? We use happiness as a standard. You must see the actual reality behind our speech, thoughts, and actions. What kind of thing should I avoid to avoid falling into the cycle of suffering? What are the things I need to face? What is the right thing I need to do, no matter how hard it is, in order to face my issues? Also, we need to see things clearly in order to see what is actually evil, what is actually good, or what is actually twisted, or what is actually pure. Is the path that I'm walking on right? This is just a metaphor. The mindset that I have, the attitude, everything we speak, is that on the right path? In the five precepts, one of them is no sexual misconduct. If we can learn about Buddhism in depth, especially the sexual misconduct precept, if we break it, we not only break our marriage, we cause harm to the people around us, not just husband and wife, your children, your own parents, and your society in general. So this is one of the cases where we need to have a very clear mind in order to resolve it, in order to avoid it. Another case about right and wrong. Say today, my actions, my speech, my decisions, are they right or wrong? Are they benefiting people or harming other people? People who have that level of selflessness are able to see through the pros and cons, the benefits and the harms, the rights and wrongs of everything. Because in a lot of cases, we do something without knowing we're harming them or hurting them, intentionally or unintentionally. Sometimes our actions, our speech, might harm people without us knowing it. Shakyamuni Buddha has told us as soon as your heart is empty, void of selfishness, that means you let go of selfishness, this false sense of self, only then will your life start to change. Everything you do, the way you eat, the way you think, the way you see things, view things, will be different. 180 degrees opposite from the worldly people. As long as there is this I, self, still there, you, your speech, actions, and thoughts will cause diseases at both the physical and mental levels. It needs to be solved, otherwise your suffering will continue. Therefore today, Buddha taught us that if we have not broken through the false sense of self, we have not let go of the false sense of self, there is no way we are able to see things unbiased and clearly. Not just Buddhism, in society, whatever career you're doing, whatever position you're in, as long as you have a heavy ego or self in there, a lot of self in there, then you can't get happiness. A lot of people thought they did good deeds in society. They thought, I have done so many good things. I donated money and much more like picking up the rubbish. Am I accumulating merits? Is that actually accumulating merits? Not necessarily. There are cases where people are doing meritorious deeds, look like they are doing meritorious deeds. However, they ended up in the three lower realms. Why? Why did that happen? It is because they don't know what is actually meritorious. They thought what they are doing is meritorious, but it's not. It's not harmful now, but it gets worse as it accumulates. 
and you keep doing the false things that you bring with you into the next life because all of the elements of selfishness are still there, mixed in there. It's like poison inside a beautiful dew. Some people are very good at speaking very nicely, looking very nice, and acting like a very nice person. And so they look like they are doing good things. But we must understand the heart behind it. Is it pure? In the past, have you seen this Chinese drama? I always watched it when I was young. Mr. Bao, you know, the Bao Qing Tian. Judge Bao lived during the Song Dynasty and was a very fair judge who had a very dark complexion and was very righteous. Everyone trusted him because he was very unbiased. There were a lot of case studies in the stories. The reason he was called unbiased was because he dared to challenge the authorities that were abusing their roles because in the eyes of the law, everyone is equal. He was then able to oversee the power and able to capture these corrupted people into the law. So why did Mr. Bao capture all of these seemingly good people? A lot of them looked like good people. Everyone praised them. But Mr. Bao exposed their actual intentions and their deeds behind the scenes. They were not actually good people. There were a lot of elements of greed and hatred inside, as well as revenge, like trying to get back at someone. So we need wisdom to see through this, something that is hidden very deep, and the point is so that we are able to do good, actually good things. In Buddhism, there is a standard for being good. You want to be a good person, right? There are standards for being a good person. To be a true good person, a person deserving to be called good, what is it? How do we define it? How does the Buddha define it? Buddha taught us in the three pure meritorious deeds. If you fulfill these three big categories of meritorious deeds, then you're considered qualified as being a good person. What is the first meritorious deed? The first one is to be filial to your parents, which is to love and respect your parents. Only then will you be considered as an entry-level good person. Then you also need to be respectful to your teachers. So love your parents and respect your teachers. Buddha is our teacher. So when he teaches you something that you understand, you should follow it. When you move up to that level, uphold the precepts of no killing, no harming sentient beings verbally or physically. Other than that, every kind deed you do, if you divert away from the standards, then it's not considered as good. It's true. Other than these standards, if you divert from them, then all the good deeds are not considered as good without this foundation, without this guide. A lot of people ask me, Master, I want to be a good person. I want to do good things. So what are the good things for me to do? I say, they are right in front of you, every time, everywhere. Wherever you are, you can do good deeds. So therefore, a lot of people say, Master, in the Buddha's Dharma Center, for example, our Dharma Center, should we do charity? Is it good? It's good, right? People say it's good. If we come here to the temple, and I want to start by doing charity, charitable deeds, I would say not necessarily. Making offerings to the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha is a big thing and is a good merit. Yes, it is. But what kind of heart do you have? What kind of attitude do you bring with you when you offer it? It's important. It's very important, actually the most important, because a lot of people bring a lot 
of elements of self, which is my fame, my position, my faith, my wealth. They are using that kind of intention to offer. If people would bring this kind of attitude and still keep it in their heart, then we didn't really learn Buddhism. We didn't really use the Buddha's Dharma to wash it away. We are not considered as true Buddhists. Therefore, when you see things, people doing charitable work, it's good, right? People recognize you. The country will even give you a plaque saying that this group of people are very good and will put you on a pedestal and praise you on national television because you have contributed a lot to the society. Is it a good thing? It looks good, but it's not right. Why? Where do you go wrong? Didn't Shakyamuni Buddha teach us to be a good person, to do good deeds, speak good words? Yeah, we should come to the Buddha temple and protect the Dharma by helping out the temple. Also, give offerings to the venerables so that you can accumulate merits. Yes, it's good. However, we must know the core value, the core foundation, the core purpose of a Dharma center. What's the point of a Dharma center? What's the first responsibility of a Dharma center? It's not to seek recognition. It's not to seek fame or praise. We are not here to accumulate wealth or to want a big temple with all the beautiful buildings and architecture so that I can control a lot of people in this place. Is that an actual Dharma center? During Shakyamuni Buddha's time, throughout his whole life, he only had three clothes. And he lived under a tree, slept under a tree. He didn't have a place actually owned by him. No, he didn't have it. He sat under trees most of the day. If he wanted to have a Dharma place, a good one, or a really luxurious one, he just needed to say, I want a Dharma place. The 16 countries would flock to him and build one in every single place he walked by. It was easy because all of his Dharma protectors are kings, but he did not accept it. He did not ask for it. So the point of Buddhism and the point of building a Dharma place that we see now is to educate. If the fundamental responsibility is not clear, then what's the point of coming here and learning Buddhism? There's no benefit from Buddhism if we do not understand why we are learning Buddhism and then Buddhism's most important role for the Dharma Center is to educate us how to be a human this is the first step and the most fundamental step. How to be a good human. How to be a decent human being. If we can't even be a decent human being and we say we want to be born in the Pure Land, do you have guarantees to do it? It's the guarantee I'm talking about. Can you be happy in this life if you can't be a decent human? Can you be healthy? Can you live carefreely if you are not a decent person? Today, to learn Buddhism, we must understand and be able to break through, see through what is actually harmful and what is actually beneficial, what is right and what is wrong. So at that point of understanding this, only then do we know that attaining enlightenment is the permanent way. It's a long-term way to actually bring us to the state of happiness or to liberate ourselves from suffering, to avoid sufferings. So every type of Dharma center must have a goal when they are established. So we're talking about a grand plan, like a shared objective, but every Dharma center must have a goal. Remember, if we are coming to a Dharma center, we must ask the first question. Today I come here to learn Buddhism. What's my goal? Today I chant Amitofo. I came to this Dharma place to chant Amitofo. Have I started to understand and am I truly confident in Buddhist teachings?
Because in this era, there are many denominations and offshoots or schools and branches of Buddhism that exist. Every single denomination and every single offshoot from the denomination have their own specific cultivation goal, like our family. Each family has different objectives. Everyone is different, so they have different ambitions and goals, and so do Dharma centers. Today, if we wish to be successful in cultivating Buddhism in these lessons, we must not mix them up mix all the denominations and offshoots up. It is because if we mix up different methods of learning Buddhism, in the end you'll learn nothing, master of none, because we're a jack of all trades. You can't get into any depth in anything. For example, one of the current branches is Pure Land Buddhism. If I want to chant Amitofo, I would go to a Pure Land Dharma Center. If I like to meditate, I can go to a Zen Dharma Center. If you want to learn Tantric or Mantra-based learning, then you can go to a Tibetan Buddhism Center. Or if you like to do good deeds, really like to help vulnerable people and connect with people, then go to Tzu Chi Foundation. You can't mix them up together. Suddenly, on one day, I wanted to go to Pure Land Dharma Center. On Tuesday, I go to a Zen temple. On Thursday, I would go to a Tibetan Buddhist temple. And on Friday, I will go to Tzu Chi Foundation. It's mixed up. It's too much. You will get confused because everyone has a different goal. They say different things and you hear them all the time. All of them are right, so nothing is right in a way, and get nowhere in your practice. Just like when we learn painting, if you want to focus on one path, you need to understand the painting itself, the techniques and all that. You need time to get into it. You can't just on one day learn painting, on Tuesday learn piano, on Thursdays learn dancing, mix them up. You need to set aside time for you to focus on getting in depth into what you want to learn. So be specific and focus on one goal and one path at a time. For a beginner of Buddhism, we must have a goal. We don't do that because we don't like other branches or temples, no. It's not because we're excluding people who are narrow-minded. The whole point is to get something in the end, to learn something in the end, because especially this denomination is actually meant for the beginners, helping the beginners so that when they come in, they only have one path, one clear path. Everyone's following that one path. You have a very clear guideline and you have peers, you have a teacher. They're all following one path and you will easily achieve success because you will move forward quickly. Especially in this era, it is not easy for a Dharma center to be certified as authentic because an authentic Dharma center will be protected, literally protected by Buddhas and heavenly beings, like they will be a bodyguard of this Dharma center. For a Dharma center to reach this authenticity, first they must have Siddharma, which is the Dharma of the Buddha, who does the teaching. Secondly, the people who follow it must be genuine, actually practice it, not just talk about it, but actually practice it. Thirdly, it truly benefits all beings. Every one of these merits are reliant on our own cultivation. It's all earned from our practice. If you want to be happy, want to achieve happiness, achieve that perfect goal, we can't just ask others to give it to us. For example, a husband and wife that argue every day. Why do they argue? My wife always demands a lot from me. She says, 
I have a lot of expectations for you, but in the end, all I get is disappointment. In the end, what's left is pain. The more you expect, the more you suffer. So for the ladies here, think about your husband. Do you have expectations of your husband? Some form of expectations? Everyone has expectations of something, not just of someone, something. But we must understand that if you want to truly have merits that are worthy of protection by the heavenly beings, we have to start from ourselves, change from ourselves, be good ourselves, rely on ourselves, and improve our own quality. To attain equally perfect enlightenment, we must break through one grade. There are many grades of ignorance. You must break through at least first grade of ignorance. Only then can you earn enlightenment to one grade of Dharmakaya, which is the body of truth or true self. And that kind of attainment is what Buddha has attained. So you're actually on the same platform as Buddha. A long way to go, but you are there. So hence it's called equally perfect enlightenment. When we attain equally perfect enlightenment, one's perception of the universe and life is very close to that of a Buddha, but we are not a Buddha yet. So this level is called Bodhisattva. It's called equally perfect enlightenment, and there's no selfishness at all. We will discuss with everyone who can be considered an actual Buddha, like at the same level of Buddha. And when you keep going down this path of breaking ignorance and keep bringing back your true self, your Buddha nature, or the Dharmakaya, then you'll reach a certain level where everything is clear and eventually you will achieve unsurpassed, equally perfect enlightenment. It's complete. It's perfect. You no longer have flaws and deficiencies. It's what we call perfection in the literal sense. In Buddhism, this person is called a Buddha. If you attain equally perfect enlightenment, you'll be called a Bodhisattva. So this is level two. The first level is Arhat, or right awakening. And then this one is equally perfect enlightenment, Bodhisattva. And then Buddha, which is the highest level. So all these names in Buddhism have a purpose. If you attain right awakening, the first step, right awakening, you are called an arhat. As you can see in this first sentence of the slide, arhat, bodhisattva, and Buddha are common titles, and there are procedures in gaining these titles. They are all humans. Their attainments were accomplished in the state of the human realm. They are not like spirit beings or something. They're humans. So where do Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, and Arhats currently reside? It's a way to describe someone who has reached the, the other shore, has crossed this shore of sufferings, of pains, of complications, all of the pain, then that person is called an Arhat, Bodhisattva, or Buddha, depending on how far they reach. Only when you achieve one of these three levels can your life be considered as a successful one. These three terms we must be familiar with, no matter what traditions or anything, as long as it's Buddhism, we must be very aware of these three terms. It's not meant to be one person. It is not an individual. You say, oh, this Bodhisattva helped me. Which Bodhisattva? Which Buddha? So it's like a professor, master, or bachelor in university. There are common titles conferred to someone who earned it. For example, our historical Buddha, Shakyamuni Buddha, is that title only reserved to him, this Prince Siddhartha? No, there are many Shakyamuni Buddhas. If you recall the name, what's the meaning of Shakyamuni? compassion and purity. So there's a lot of Buddhas that are compassionate and pure, 
across the Dharma realms. Isn't Shakyamuni Buddha only meant to the one, the Prince Siddhartha? It is in case, but in its most deepest sense of meaning, it's not just one person. It goes beyond one person. In the Tang Dynasty, Precept Master Dao Xuan was the first patriarch of the school of precepts in China. Just for information, the school of precepts is shared by both Theravada and Mahayana. Do you have any impressions of this master? I think a lot of us know of him, but there are many young people who don't know. Venerable Master Dao Xuan was the patriarch of the school of precepts in China. He was very famous when he cultivated on the mountain. You know who gives the offering to him? He actually cultivated in the mountains. The heavenly beings were the ones who cooked for him and offered it to Venerable Master Dao Xuan. He didn't even need to ask for alms among the folks. He didn't need to worry about food, cooking, washing. Heavenly beings just offered this to him. You know why heavenly beings thought he was deserving of receiving alms? Because he actually held precepts. He actually followed precepts. His behavior was right. A lot of people say Shakyamuni Buddha was the one from India, right? The sage from India. No, it's not just referring to him. He is everywhere. Shakyamuni Buddha is everywhere not just on this earth, in many, many universes. Another famous example, Guanyin Bodhisattva. Avalokiteshvara is Guanyin. Is this one person? No. It is also a title. There are many Guanyin Bodhisattvas. Like, is there only one professor in the world? No, right? There are many professors. Professor Lee, Professor Alex, Professor Malcolm, there are an infinite number of them. Which one are you referring to if you call their name? Even with medical doctors, there are many doctors in hospitals. Which doctor do you want to refer to? If we think they are only one person, then we are wrong. Bodhisattva Guanyin, what does Bodhisattva Guanyin mean? Compassion. A person who is really compassionate is Guanyin Bodhisattva. There are a lot of Bodhisattvas or the practitioners who have attained equally perfect enlightenment Bodhisattva level that are very compassionate, that have boundless compassion. That means there are a lot of Guanyin Bodhisattvas. Then there is also another Bodhisattva, Dizang. Dizang means earth treasure. Maitreya means happiness. There are endless Maitreya Buddhas. They're all compassionate. So which one are you referring to? For example, Guanyin Bodhisattva. If you are actually as compassionate as Guanyin, then you are Guanyin. If you have a strong vow of saving all the beings and being respectful and filial to your parents, in all beings, then you are Kasidigarbha Bodhisattva. Buddhists get this mixed up, confused with the names of Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, and Arhats. They get confused with it. If you ask people around, your parents, your friends, your peers, what's a Bodhisattva, or in Chinese, Pusa, they can't explain it. It's hard. They don't understand. They have no concept of it. In our youth group, if you ask what a bodhisattva is, are we clear what a bodhisattva is? Before we learned this, we were confused. We did not learn it in depth, so we didn't know. We always thought this name was an individual. We didn't know that there is infinite meaning inside this name. Have you all read the Infinite Life Sutra? Yes, we have. It's actually very good. It's just that we need to find an English version. And what is Amitabha Sutra? 
What is Amitofo? We are also not clear. What is Shakyamuni Buddha? We also don't know. We should learn. If we don't learn, how can we cultivate? If we don't know who is my teacher and what is the profile of my teacher, then how do I attain anything under him? If I say Amitofo and I don't know who Amitofo is, how can I have a connection with this teacher and actually learn? Same goes for Guanyin Bodhisattva and Ditsang Bodhisattva. We need to learn. There is only benefit and no harm at all. Buddha and the Infinite Life Sutra. So in the Sutra, people in the Pure Land, every one of them practice Samantapadra Bodhisattva's vows. So they all act like Samantapadra Bodhisattva. People who are born there, they are all Samantapadra Bodhisattvas, which means they all practice the Ten Great Vows. And the number of Samantapadra Bodhisattvas are infinite. There is no way you can calculate them. Where is Samantapadra Bodhisattva? We should ask, which Samantapadra Bodhisattva? As a Buddhist, we should understand in this way of learning Buddhism, we will not fall into superstition or get lost when we are learning it. So I would like to continue in depth next time so that we are no longer treated as a superstitious group because we know what we are learning. We have a clear objective of what we are learning. For example, I believe in Buddha. I have taken the precepts. I have taken refuge and precepts. Some will ask, what is Buddha? They cannot provide a satisfactory answer. What is refuge? You don't know. What is a bodhisattva? I don't know. That statue? I am not sure. There is a lot of this happening inside the temple among the Buddhist community. It's very unfortunate. I hope that as the youth group we need to take it seriously. Take the Buddhist teaching and understanding of Buddhism seriously. Only then can we understand what we have learned and how to lead ourselves and others to learn. In Buddhism, what do we learn? If I ask you this question, what do we seek in Buddhism? And all of us should be clear of what we are looking for. Let's continue. We are looking for wisdom. I would like to repeat myself. Seeking wisdom is the first thing we need to seek. How do we seek wisdom? Let's think about it. In Zen Buddhism, it is to seek enlightenment. Pure Land Buddhism talks about one-mindedness, one-heartedness, not moving. In Pure Land Buddhism, if you have achieved that single-mindedness of Amitofo, Translated into Zen, you have gained full enlightenment. In Pure Land Buddhism, chanting Amitofo, everyone has qualifications to attain that level, going to the Pure Land. And once you deepen your learning, then you have broken through the doubt. You no longer have doubt. And then you know why we need to go into the single-mindedness of chanting Amitofo. So going back to the big question, why are we learning Buddhism? To seek wisdom. So we will go in depth on this next week. So now I would like to just give you a brief overview of what is right awakening, equally perfect enlightenment, and unsurpassed equally perfect enlightenment. Unsurpassed equally perfect enlightenment is Buddha, Bodhisattva, and then Arhat. And knowing these three main titles in Buddhism, why do we take refuge? Why are we learning Buddhism? These will be explained next week as well. We have also explained this in the previous class. Today we also talked about denominations and schools of Buddhism. But we also talked about what the point of the goal of Buddhism is and why we choose this Pure Land school out of all of them. So we will talk about that next week.
Next week, Wednesday, I would like to invite you all to learn again. If today I have said anything not right or inappropriate, then please give me some feedback. Thank you so much. Amitofo. May you all be healthy. Amitofo. Let's dedicate our merits. May the merits and virtues accrued from this work, merits accrued from the Dharma talks, dedicate to all beings in the universe and dedicate to our karma creditors so that they all may be born in the pure land. Repay the four kindnesses above and relieve the sufferings of those in the three paths below. May those who see or hear of this aspire to invoke the Bodhi heart and cultivate the teachings for the rest of this life, then be born together in the land of ultimate bliss.